<clears throat> good morning, good morning, good morning, everybody. Feels uh feels a little odd to see that. Um having uh moved this my my schedule around um the, the last several weeks. I uh, definitely appreciate you all's patience and um your consistency with uh still uh, trying to to get on and, and make um make the time uh, when when I'm able to to be on and so uh this morning we're going to be in Acts chapter uh 27 Acts chapter 27 and this morning I just ask that you would uh be in prayer for for me uh, I'm not feeling my best but um I definitely want to um handle business as it as it as it were so um, I'm here to um, walk us through Acts chapter number 27. And uh, I called today uh, navigating under his direction, navigating under his direction. Um, one of the, I, I would say one of the great challenges that we face um, as believers in, um, in a, in a world in an age where things, where you can, uh, have Google at your fingertips, right? You can, uh, you can have, you have information at your fingertips. You have the ability to, um, find out anything you want to know, right? Um, just type it into your search engine, Google being Yahoo, it doesn't really matter. And you can, um, you can access that information, right? And one of the, the struggles, I guess you could say, and this is just me from personal experience, yet it, I do believe that it is, it is something that um, we've all faced at some point in time in our, in our Christian walk. And that is, uh, what do you do when you don't have all the information, right? What do you do when you can't Google or text or call somebody and get the answer to whatever it is you might be facing? Yeah, um, we know and we understand that being a disciple, um, being a follower of Jesus Christ, God is not entitled nor is he obligated to give us all of the answers, right? As it relates to our life. See, what's interesting is that what we're going to see with Paul today, and I'll make this point again, um, what we're going to see, what we do see in scripture rather, is that God has made known to us enough. What's up, bro? Good to see you. Uh, God has made, made enough known to us right for us to trust him he's made enough known to us for us to trust him um and by him revealing just enough right now it is incumbent upon us to make sure that no matter what the situation looks like we have to go back to what god has already revealed all right so it doesn't matter if it's a Monday, a Tuesday, if you're in a, a season, a great season, if you're in a bad season of life, if, you, if things are well, if things are not well. Um, what God has already revealed about our lives in Scripture takes precedence over the circumstance, and we'll make this clear um, as we move through um, chapter 27, all right? But I just want to kind of lay the foundation for where we're, going to, uh, where we're going to land today. So before we dive into 27, I want to go to Proverbs chapter number three. I want to go to Proverbs chapter number three, a passage we've heard several times um, I want to walk this down today uh, with Acts chapter number 27. Um, 
And before we do that, let us pray. Um, Lord, we love you. Um, we thank you. Thank you for our time in your word. I thank you for the consistency of your voice. Not only the consistency of your voice, God, but the consistency of your hand. Uh, thank you, Lord, that uh, as our shepherd, you don't lead us with, uh, with instruments that would harm us. You don't lead us with whips, um, briars and thorns. Father, you lead us with a shepherd's crook. And we know that from times uh, past, as we've examined the purpose of a shepherd's crook is if a sheep is moving in the wrong direction, the hook, the candy cane on the end uh, of that rod and that staff is able to go around the neck of the sheep and redirect them where they need to go. And so again, I thank you for the consistency of your voice, the consistency of your hand. And now, Father, I pray that you would be with us during this time, uh, that you would speak clearly, although it is me audibly that the people here, Father, I pray that their hearts would hear from you. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Quick shout out to my brothers, Marcus and Brenton. If you guys did not have the opportunity to check those videos out, uh, please go back and do that. Um, as I'm here in 27, Marcus will close us out in the book of Acts tomorrow. And uh, Brenton will open us up in the books of, book of Romans, the first chapter on Thursday. Um, we thought Acts was fun. And, well, Acts was fun. But getting into Romans and now the, the other Pauline epistles is going, going to be uh, quite an interesting time. And so um, pray that you're able to be with us for that. All right. So here we go. Uh, Proverbs chapter 3. Um, let's go to verse number. Um, let's just begin at verse one. Uh, as we know, Solomon is is talking to his boys and he has a thing he wants to um, make known to them. He says, my son, do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands. Excuse me. In your heart, for they will prolong your life many years and bring you prosperity. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all, with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding in all your ways. Acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. I wanted to read Proverbs 3 this morning because we're going to see a situation that has developed with Paul here in chapter number 27. And we're going to see the difference between what it looks like when you navigate your life with under your direction or under his direction. All right. Now, I want to be very clear that um, what we're going to see here in 27, these are not this is not a direct um, moment uh, for the characters mentioned or that will be mentioned where God was speaking directly to um, these men. OK, so I'm only I'm only showing Proverbs three. With. Acts 27, so we can draw some principles, okay? Um, so, last chapter, 26, uh, Paul appeared before um, Agrippa, right? And um, it was uh, it was arranged by Festus for uh, Agrippa to, to hear Paul out uh, because Festus was uh, wanting another opinion, right, on what to do with Paul because of the accusations of the Jews, right? And so um, in 27, now Paul sets sail for Rome, all right? Um, Paul is on his way to where Britain pointed out two weeks ago, right, that this is where Paul needed to end up anyway, was Rome, all right? And so now um, Paul has made his appeal to Nero Caesar and having been seen by Felix Festus 
now Agrippa, now Paul is getting on a ship to head to uh, to Rome. So verse 1 says, when it was decided that we would sail for, for Italy, Paul and some other prisoners were handed over to a centurion named Julius who belonged to the Imperial Regiment. We boarded a ship from Adramidium about to sail for ports along the coast of the province of Asia, and we put out to sea. Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica, was with us. The next day we landed at Sidon, and Julius, in kindness to Paul, allowed him to go uh, to his friends so they might provide for his needs. From there, we put out to sea again and passed to the lee of Cyprus because the winds were against us. When we had sailed across the open sea uh, off the coast of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we landed at Myra in Lycia. There, the centurion found an Alexandrian ship um, sailing for Italy and put us on board. We made slow headway for many days and had difficulty arriving off Snidus. When the wind did not allow us to hold our course, we sailed to the lee of Crete opposite Salmon. We moved along the coast with difficulty and came to a place called Fair Havens um, near the town of Lycia. Much time had already been lost and, um, say, and sailing had already become dangerous because by now it was after the fast. So Paul warned them, and I can see that our voyage is going to be disastrous and bring great loss to ship and cargo and to our own lives also. But the centurion, instead of listening to what Paul said, followed the advice of the pilot and the owner of the ship. I want to stop there um, because this this moment is, is very interesting um, because the text says that it was after the fast. Now, um, upon further research, uh, this this fast was one that followed um, the Day of Atonement, and it typically took place in late September, early October. So late in the fall um, is when this this took place. And so they're setting sail at a historically bad time. OK, at a historically bad time. It is not um, advised that um, you travel. Right. Um, it, it is almost the equivalent of what we're about to see here is almost the equivalent of you're about to get on a cruise ship dead in the middle of hurricane season, right? In the middle of hurricane season at the most prominent place where hurricanes occur. Um, and, and you think it, it it's wise to go ahead and just hop on a ship, right? And, um, uh, and, and go, go have a great time, right? As great of a time as you would have. History says this is not a really good time for us to be sailing. OK, it's, this doesn't really make um, good sense. Now, it's interesting that Paul speaks up about this, because if you go, uh, let's journey over to second. Um, second Corinthians, let's go to the 11th chapter, because we see something. Um, from Paul here that I think is important for us and that will give what that will carry some weight behind why Paul said what he said. All right. So let's go to second Corinthians 11 and let's slide on down to verse number um, 24. All right. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry, verse number 25. Now, Paul, what he's here, he's writing to obviously the church of Corinth and he is um, laying out all of the things he's had to go through with being a disciple, with being an apostle. OK, and so he says three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned three times. I was shipwrecked a night and day, a night and a day. I have spent adrift on the sea. Many times on journeys exposed to danger from rivers, dangers from bandits, dangers from my own countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, danger among those posing as believers in labor and hardship, often unable to sleep in hunger and thirst, often driven to fasting 
for lack of food in cold and exposure without adequate coaling, clothing. Besides those external things, there is the daily pressure of my concern for all the churches. So here, Paul, what we see, you say, Aaron, why is it important that you read that? It's important because um, chronologically, 2 Corinthians um, was written, I believe, before... Um, before um before we got here uh to acts right and so the paul had already been out on on the waters and has experienced some hard times right he has experienced um being shipwrecked not including what we're seeing here in 27 so for one who has been out on the sea right in different times uh throughout the year Knowing what season that they're going into, Paul speaks up and tells the people, hey, listen, let's just hang out um, and not try to, to force our way um, to Rome. Right. Uh, let's just kind of let's just kind of wait a little bit uh, it, because verse 12 says this. It says, uh, since the harbor was unsuitable to winter in, the majority decided that we should sail on, hoping to reach Phoenix and winter there. This was a harbor in Crete facing both Southwest and Northwest. So where they ended up, right? Paul was saying, listen, let's just hang out here. Now the text doesn't go into all the detail about why Paul wanted to hang out there. But from what we read in second Corinthians chapter 11, Paul has experienced shipwreck before Paul has, ex he has seen some uh, similarities, right? In, in what they were getting ready to face. Because again, from, the very beginning, they were already dealing with strong headwinds, right? Trying to make their way up the coast to Rome. They were already experiencing difficulty. And as Paul is watching and observing and seeing the situation unfold, he knows what's on the other side if they continue to try to force their way. All right. Now, I want to parallel that with us, right? When it comes to us navigating our lives under the, under the direction of the Holy Spirit, right? Understand this, that number one, you never lose sight of the big picture, as I mentioned on Friday, right? Which was for us to be conformed into the image of Jesus Christ and for us to go and make disciples. That is the overarching goal of God's will for our lives, okay? Now, how we navigate situation by situation will vary, OK, but it, it's very interesting because I find myself sometimes and I know we've all had these moments, right? When God will speak to us, the Holy Spirit will speak to us concerning something. And for whatever reason, because we think that we have a good grip on it, we think we have a, a better understanding. We'll say, oh, I, I hear you. I hear you, Lord. But. But let me just push on a little further, right? Let me just push my agenda just a little bit further, right? And although we are literally having a conversation with the one who has been here since before time as we know it began, right? The one who sees the past, who is already in the future and is in control of our present, sometimes we will forego listening to the voice because we think that we have a a better idea and we have a better uh a better plan right and that's what we see um in this moment we see paul trying to admonish the people hey hey hey, listen y'all let's just wait let's, let's let's not try to push this because we're going to end up losing cargo we're going to end up losing uh probably the whole ship as it as it is and so it's just not and we'll even possibly lose our own lives if we try to fight this storm all right let's move on verse 13 says when a gentle south wind began to blow they thought they had obtained what they wanted so they weighed anchor and sailed along the shore of crete now this is very interesting right because this is where this is where we run the risk of getting caught up, right? 
is when we are trying to force our own way, right? When we're trying to make our own decisions, although God may have already given us some type of direction or the Holy Spirit may have already spoken, but then we see something that may agree with what we're trying to do. And so therefore we go ahead and just step on the gas even more, right? We see something that says, oh, wait, that, that looks like what I'm trying to do. So let me just go ahead and step on the gas and keep going. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, do not get superstitious. Okay. That's the, that's the, that's the, the one thing I want to point out at this moment is do not get superstitious. If the Holy Spirit has spoken to you and given you direction, and if he has um, laid out the pathway for which, for whatever moment or season of life you're in, and he's given you clear direction on that, right? Even if you see something that may agree with the direction you're trying to take, don't get superstitious and say, oh, that must be a sign from the Lord. See, see the way that I'm trying to do things. It ain't, it ain't all that bad because look now there, there's a way for me to get it done. It's a setup. It's a setup. 100%. It is a setup because again, God is always proactive never reactive. He's always proactive. So he's already said what needs to be said for the moment that you have not yet experienced. Say it again. God is proactive in that he has already said what needs to be said for the moment that you have not yet experienced. Again, I'm just drawing I'm just drawing a line, a little contrast here between how we're seeing Paul navigate and then how um, the Holy Spirit is active and navigates in our own lives, right? So Paul is telling the men beforehand, hey, listen, let's not go. The men say, verse 13, when a gentle south wind began to blow. So now we've been fighting headwinds this whole way. You know what I'm saying? We've been, we've been struggling, trying to get the boat where it needs to go. And finally, there is a break in the wind. And it's a gentle south wind. Boy, I tell you, listen, Paul, I know you said we need to go. Look this. There is a gentle south wind, and now we can do it. I'm not making it up. That's what the text says. They thought they had obtained what they wanted. And is that not the problem that we face exactly, bro, test or temptation? Is that when we see something, it looks like, oh, there it is. That, that's what I wanted to get done. And boom, we, I mean, we run head first into this thing. Paying absolutely no attention to what God had said. None. But let's look at what, what verse 14 says. Before very long. So now you had an opportunity. You've got your first warning, right? You had your opportunity to stay put and wait it out. Before very long, a wind of hurricane force called the Northeaster swept down from the island. The ship was caught by the storm and could not head into the wind. So we gave way to it and were driven along. As we passed the lee of a small island called Kada, we were hardly able to make the lifeboat secure. When the men had ho hoisted it aboard, they passed ropes under the ship itself to hold it together, fearing that they would run aground on the sandbars of Sirtas. They lowered the sea anchor and let the ship be driven along. We took such a violent battering from the storm that the next day they began to throw the cargo overboard. On the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days the st and the storm continued raging, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. The very moment that they saw an opening and they said, well, this is it. This is our opportunity. The situation changes. Let me make this point. Don't let an opportunity push you to not be obedient. 
Don't let an opportunity for you to navigate your life the way that you think it should be navigated or the way you're feeling at the time, or don't let an opportunity to make a decision, right? Push you to not be obedient to what God has already said. And again, please hear me very, very clearly. I'm only showing similarities, right, between Paul and the way that the Holy Spirit speaks. I, what I am not saying, I'm not saying is that Paul is speaking on behalf of God in this moment, okay? Because, again, contextually and biblically, that's not accurate here. I'm just showing some principles. So here it is. Paul has the experience of being shipwrecked. The men say, uh, Paul, we can do it. Let's go. That's a gentle south wind. Whoop de whoop. Let's go. Immediately, everything changes. And it says that the ship was caught by the storm. They could not head into the wind. So they gave way to the storm. And now they're at the mercy of the storm. Ladies and gentlemen, when we make decisions, after God has been very clear to us, right? At that moment, when you make that decision, you are now at the mercy of your own decisions. Hear me clear. When, when there has been forewarning and you decide to push anyway, you are now at the mercy of your own decisions. See, because God, again, in, in him being proactive, he speaks before the situation occurs. Now, depending on if you listen to him or not, shows your level of trust. But when you decide not to trust him and you get involved in a in a situation, right, you're now at the mercy of whatever that situation has for you. Now, that's not to say that God has abandoned you because he hasn't. Right. But he will let you sit and deal with your own decisions. Right. Because not because he's mean, not because he's some cruel God. No, he wants you to learn and he wants you to grow. So you can either learn and grow the easy way or you can learn and grow the hard way. Regardless, you're going to learn. You're going to. Well, I hope you learn. One way or another, you'll learn or grow. Because let's keep in mind, ladies and gentlemen, Paul has to stand before Caesar. Why? Because God already told Paul he needed to be in Rome. So for Paul to die here at sea, well, then somebody was not telling the truth, right? If Paul never makes it to Rome, well, then you begin to question the credibility of what God said, right? But no, we know that Paul has to appear before Rome, does appear in Rome. So let's look at how now that you've made a bad decision, right? How do you navigate during the bad decision, right? It's easy to navigate when you've made the right one, but how do you navigate when you've made the wrong one? See, because there's still a responsibility, ladies and gentlemen, on our lives as disciples. And that is we are still to live out this life of discipleship. We are still to put trust on the table in the good and in the bad. So now let's work at this through, through the bad. So now, um, so now they are, um, uh, let, let me just pause for a second. Let me pause for a second. Many years ago for my accident. And this is actually the first chapter of my book that I'm writing, um, that deals with me in this, this, what I call the Job journey of being in this wheelchair, there was a road that, that led to um, the job that I used to work at. And uh, when it got really bad, like when it would rain a uh, storm for many days, it would, uh, the road would flood over. Right. Uh, but I had driven the road after some rain and, you know, and, and I've been through there before a couple times. And I, one, one particular day, it had rained quite a bit, I think that week. And so the uh, the road crew came out and put up signs, right, that said detour, 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 go this way, go that way. And I said to myself, I said, self, you've driven this road many times. You've seen it when it's rained. You've seen the water kind of be 
you know, up by the fence post and stuff. So, I mean, you'll be all right, right? Keep going, right? And so I insist on my own way going down this road. Keep seeing the sign. The sign says detour, detour, detour. I'm saying turn around, don't drown, all that type of stuff. I said, man, I've been here before. I know this. Ladies and gentlemen, I get, I, I waste all the time, right, driving the, that route to get to work only to find that the road is inaccessible. There is a crossing. There, There's one low part of this road that there's no way around it, right? I can't go down and, you know, bust a left here, bust a left there. No, no, no. This is it. It's just one stretch of road. And so when it gets flooded, you have to go almost all the way back to town and then hit the highway to um, to get to my job. And I persisted in my own way. And had I had I just I'm glad I didn't. But had I decided to attempt to cross the water, right, my truck would have been swept by the water. And I would have been in the ditch somewhere, right? Get trying to get out of a out of a truck that was that was sinking in the water. I would have been at the mercy of that decision, right? Granted, the only thing I lost that day was time, right? I, I was late getting to work because of my own decision making. Luckily, that was all that I lost that day because the loss could have been much more right could have been a, a vehicle tore up um if when i um drove through the water it happened to 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 roll me over uh, because of the way that the water was rushing you know i could have possibly lost my life these are the risks that we run when we when we think that we know better right i thought that i knew better than the road crew the road crew has been out there looked at the road and said listen this is inaccessible put up the signs we want to divert traffic away from this area because we don't want anybody to get hurt. But here I come, having driven the road for however many months that I had. Oh, wow, come on. I, I see the signs. I know better. Uh, Y'all, we do the same thing to the Lord. Again, he's been here from the very beginning. And he'll say something to us. But if it's something that we that we kind of got a little, that we think we got a little knowledge about, well, no, no, hold on. Wait a minute, Lord. Just, 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 just wait a second. I hear you, but you don't, you don't know the situation like I know the situation. Well, the reality is he does. He knows the situation a lot better than you because he knows you. But yet we'll, we'll, we will push our own way. And now some of us have made decisions and now we're at the mercy of the decision. So how do we navigate now that we are at the mercy of a bad decision? It's not easy. It's not easy what, what, what is next, but what's funny is, is it's the same thing that was there at the beginning. You trust. Now, the only thing is, now you're trusting with a lot more weight on your shoulders. Now you're trusting with a lot more anxiety on your shoulders. Now you're trusting with a lot more depression on your shoulders. Now you're trusting with a lot more fear on your shoulders. See, it's one thing if they would have pulled the boat over in the first harbor and, and hung out there and then they're watching this storm come by. Right. But they're they're hanging out on the harbor. Right. They're not out on the sea. They're watching the storm pass. And however long it takes to pass, then they get on the boat. That's one thing. Right. That That's what you would call an easy moment to trust the Lord, because we, we heard. Boom. Let's go. Let's get off. Let's get off the sea. Paul, Paul's been here before. He's seen it. Hey, I trust you, Paul. Let's let's go on and just get off the here at this harbor and we'll we'll wait it out. I, I know the the harbor is not exactly suitable for winter. We might be a little uncomfortable, but it's better to be uncomfortable on land than be at the mercy of a hurricane on sea. Right. Listen, you ain't got to tell me twice. I would much rather. Watch a hurricane on TV in the middle of the ocean from the comfort of my house than I would in my cabin room on a cruise ship in the middle of the hurricane. You know what I mean? Like that, that's a no brainer. But at the moment, 
right? Because notice what the text says. The text says, before very long. So there was a time, there was a time span where the situation looked favorable. The beauty of people that plan uh, the, these cruises and the, the routes that you take and all of that, they look they look pretty far ahead to see the weather forecast, right? Depending on how long the ship's going to be out, what's happening on the seas at that time, right? So they have a they have a general idea of what to expect based on certain weather patterns. Now, can that change in an instant? One hundred percent, it can, right? But for the most part, they have a good forecast of what to what to expect. Ladies and gentlemen, God has the only accurate forecast of the things that we're going to face. Right now, we may be we may have some good indicators right about what what may be coming up next or uh, something to kind of anticipate. Maybe. Right. But it is only the father that has the precise answer. And so we would do very well that if he says, hey, don't do that. Hey, nah, I don't say that. Hey, don't go there. Hey, that we would pay attention because a storm is a lot easier to deal with when you're not in the middle of it, right? Thunderstorms plague Texas like crazy, especially during the spring. Um, yet again, I would rather be enduring a storm from the safety of my home than I would out on the highway driving to get to my house, right? And so now Paul and them are in the middle of this storm trying to figure out how do we navigate now, right? For many days in the storm continued raging, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. After the men had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, now, we're going to see here, um, in, in just in a few verses, actually, that it's about 14 days that the sun has not been out. All right. They've been in the middle of a hurricane for 14 days trying to deal with this storm. Look at this. It says Paul stood up before them and said, men, you should have taken my advice not to sail from Crete. Then you would have spared yourselves this damage and loss. Now, two things I want to point out about this. Number one, uh, actually, actually, just one thing is that the way that they're having to to travel now. Um, it's actually long. It's going to take longer to get to Rome. Because of the way the wind was blowing. Um, if you look up in your Bible or uh, just a, a map of Paul's journey to Rome, you can see where they intended to go, right? And so from Phoenix, they could have went a little more, uh, a little more straight, a little more north. But because of the way that the the wind was blowing and all this, so it actually pushed them further south, right? Uh, did you see that a gentle south wind was blowing? They, they jumped in on it, and now the, the wind became too much and actually pushed them further south than what they needed to be. So now it was going to take them longer to get to Rome. When we decide that we are the better captains of our proverbial ships of our lives, we always run the risk of delaying where we need to be. Again. No matter the season of life that you're in, you are to be conformed to the image of Christ and you are to make disciples. You are to, you are to be conformed to the image of Christ and make disciples. 100% a great contrast between Paul and Jonah. Paul, functioning in obedience, Jonah running from what God wanted him to do. Now, interestingly enough, they both ended up where they needed to end up. Paul ends up in Rome. Jonah ends up in Nineveh. Paul is delayed. This is so funny. 
Paul is delayed because of the decisions of those around him. Jonah is delayed because of his personal decision. Yeah. Yeah. So this is very interesting. Paul, and we're really dealing with the, the, the people on the ship, not so much Paul, but now we're going to look at Paul. Okay. Because this is how you navigate in the middle of a storm, right? This is how you navigate. Check this out. Look at what Paul says. You should have taken my advice not to sail from Crete. Then you would have spared yourselves this damage and loss. See, Paul knows he's getting to Rome. Okay. What time he arrives in Rome? Subjective. But Paul knows he's making it to Rome. Now, for the men, you guys could have saved a lot of this cargo if you would have just listened. But now you're going to have to experience loss because of your decision. When we decide to navigate outside of the parameters of which God has called us to, Know this, ladies and gentlemen, that in some form or fashion, you will experience loss. I don't know what that's going to be. I'm not saying you're going to lose your life. I'm not saying, um, you know, you're going to lose everything that's around you. I'm not saying that, but understand this, that you will experience loss to some degree. Because, again, had they just hung out at the harbor, although it was not ideal, they would not be losing cargo like they're losing. Look at this. It says, but now I urge you to keep up your courage because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. Now, hold on. Hold on. Wait a minute, P. You're telling me that we need to keep our courage the only thing that's going to that's going to sink is the ship but we're going to live that's that's great that's great news it really is you know what i mean but at the same time you don't want to be thinking about the ship is about to be destroyed but i'm going to live cuz now you're thinking about if i'm in the middle of the ocean off the coast of the asia minor how in the world am i going to get back to land Right. All right. Look at this. Look at this. Last night. <laughs> Ooh, goodness. Last night, an angel of the God whose I am and whom I serve stood beside me. So here it is, ladies and gentlemen. Paul, I, I love this moment because this moment reminds me of when Jesus was on the boat with the disciples right and the and the, the wind started blowing and jesus was down in the bottom of the boat just sleeping and the master master cares thou not that we perish all of this stuff right and i see this storm happening in my mind i see them dealing with these winds and and i just see paul just chilled paul's not frantic paul's not running around screaming about what they're going to do paul i could really just Imagine with my sanctified imagination, Paul just chilling in the in the boat. Why? Because an angel of the Lord appeared to Paul. Let's look at what he said. Do not be afraid, Paul. I love the fact that when that when when we find ourselves in situations, and again, we may have made some decisions. And God speaks. He always addresses what the biggest thing is first. He always knows what to speak to first. And he speaks to Paul's fear, right? And in this, we see Paul's humanity, right? Because any normal person would be afraid. In the middle of a hurricane, whether, again, Paul's not there because he decided to sail. No, the, the guy who was transporting them decided to sail. So he's at the mercy of their decisions. He says, don't, don't be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar. And God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. Y'all, please don't miss what I'm about to say. Please don't miss what I'm about to say. If you find yourself in a storm because of somebody else's decisions, 
don't fail. Do not fail at being the example they need to see. I'll say it again. If you find yourselves in the middle of a proverbial storm because of the decisions that somebody else has made, do not fail to be the example that those around you need to see. What does that look like? I don't know. It could be it could be a job situation, right, where your boss makes a decision and it puts you proverbially in your mind um, in, in a in a moment of testing, in a moment of uh, or a moment of tempting. Right. It could be a moment at your job. It could be something with your family. Um, I don't know what it looks like for you, but I know what it looks like for Paul. Paul is trying to get to Rome. Other people made decisions. And now Paul is subject to those decisions. Paul's not the captain of the ship. Paul's not the centurion guard. Paul's literally a prisoner. And okay, y'all made the decision. I, I said we shouldn't do it, but we're here now. And now Paul is in the position, right, to be an example to those around him. Because what does the angel of the Lord say? He says, God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. I'm going to read it again. God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. This is a very important moment for Paul because on the one hand, God, I didn't do anything to end up in the middle of this hurricane, right? But now that I'm here, help me to navigate myself in a way that brings glory and honor to you so that those who are around me can see, what does Paul say? The God whose I am and whom I serve. So that I get it. It's a jacked up situation, Lord. We're in the middle of a hurricane. We are losing cargo. It has been dark for 14 days and there is no light whatsoever. There is no help in sight. But I know it's bad, but I know who you are. And so help me to conduct myself in such a way that shows the other ones around me that I belong to you. That's what he told him. He said, angel of the Lord, the God that I belong to and the God that I serve, he told me that I've got to stand trial before, before Caesar. So guess what? We're going to make it to Rome. Now, how many of you make it to Rome with me? That is incumbent upon the next decisions that you make. Look at this. Uh, so keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. Nevertheless, we must run aground on some island. So now let's start figuring out how we're going to run this ship um, close to the island because they were sailing close to the close to the edge. Right. Um, of the island. So we got to find a, a, a high spot or a low spot where we can run the ship onto some rocks or something to where we don't die out here. All right, look at this. On the 14th night, we were still being driven across the Adriatic, Adriatic Sea. When about midnight, the sailors sensed they were approaching land, they took soundings and found that the water was 120 feet deep. A short time later, uh, they took soundings again and found it was 90 feet deep. So it's getting more and more shallow. Um, fearing that we would be dashed against the rocks, they dropped four anchors from the stern and prayed for daylight. Here it is. In an attempt to escape from the ship, the sailors let the lifeboat down into the sea, pretending they were going to lower some anchors from the bow. Then Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men stay with the ship, you cannot be saved. So the soldiers cut the ropes that held the lifeboat and let it fall away. So now in the moment, right? So the decision was made. Y'all are in the middle of a storm. Here comes some encouraging word for you. Listen, y'all are going to live, but the ship not going to make it. Cargo not going to make it. 
But if you trust in my servant, Paul, right, I will I will make sure that you all live. Now, here comes another situation, right? So that's good. And, and here's here's what I want us to not miss with this is that when God gives a word, okay. I love the way he gives the word because it's almost like a blanket. Okay. Because he says, Paul, you've got to stand trial before Caesar. So from when you got on the boat in Jerusalem, let me show it this way. Yeah. To standing um, trial before Caesar, everything in the middle, my word is sufficient for that. So the storm, my word is sufficient. The fact that the water is getting more and more shallow and y'all are about to run the ship into some rocks. My word is sufficient for that. Only when we get to Rome does what I does what I said at this moment. Become fulfilled. So at the moment that Paul stands before Caesar. Now that whole moment was fulfilled, right? That moment was fulfilled. That you'll stand trial before Caesar and you guys will not die. Now that's the fulfillment. Now we move on to the next word. So again, from where you begin to what God, to what God says the end goal is, his word is sufficient. Now, look at this for us. We've not made it to glory yet, right? We know that we are to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ and we are to make disciples. Now, everything in between his word has covered. From those moments of us being called, being disciples, making disciples, being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ until we make it home to glory, his word has blanketed all of that, right? In that his promises are still good. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. Still good. Doesn't matter what situation I'm in. If I keep my mind focused on him, right? He'll keep me in perfect peace. If I trust in the Lord with all my heart and lean not to my own understanding, despite what the present situation looks like, he will show me which way to go, right? Your lamp, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Despite the situation, your word is still good. All right, so let, let's keep moving. So um, they, they hear the word, the encouragement, right? God is going to, he's going to save us. Okay, I hear you, Paul. Cool. Hey, check this out, y'all. Let's go on and drop down this lifeboat like we try to put down the anchors and we finna. Now, listen, y'all, I just we just made it clear that y'all are in the middle of a very bad storm and the big ship is finna go down. And you think that you want to jump on a lifeboat and and that'll be any better. Hey, Aunt Val, good to see you. No problem. No problem. Um. So even in the middle of now, you've gotten the word, right? Because at first, at first, Paul said, listen, let's not do it. All right. You get into a situation. Paul says, all right, listen, the angel spoke to me. All right. We're going to make it to Rome. I hear you, Paul. But then you're still trying to look for a way to get out of it. No, 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 no. Understand this, ladies and gentlemen. When you make the decision and the storm has come, you're, there is no way to get out of that storm in your own thinking. Oh, no, 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 no. You sit with this and you trust him for the process. You sit in the storm, you cry, you get mad, you get scared, you get fearful. Everything that you're feeling, you sit with that and you trust him in the process. Because everything that you're feeling could have been avoided if we would have listened the first time. Okay. Okay. All the emotions, all the being overwhelmed could have been avoided 
if we would have listened at first. I'm going to tell y'all something. I don't mind being transparent. I really don't. Listen, where I am now and everything that I have to deal with with being in this wheelchair, hear me very, very clearly. God's grace has been sufficient. I've had to literally, and I'm not being funny when I say this, I've literally had to sit with this storm. Yeah, I've had to sit with this. See, my accident wasn't caused by drunk driving, like me being inebriated or um, sleepy and, and I did this, right? No, no, no. I'm coming home. I'm on my way home. And somebody else not paying attention runs into the back of my car. Now, I, I say that because it's another way of looking at the diamond. I understand why I'm here, right? Because again, what did, what, did, what did I just say? We have to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, and we have to make disciples in the process. So this wheelchair is, is my chisel, okay? I don't know what your chisel is going to look like, but my chisel is this wheelchair. And even though I was not the direct cause of what happened, it's necessary, right? Even though it wasn't my failure to hit the brakes or to, to yield for traffic or anything like that, that got me here, right? There was still, it's still necessary because God needed to deal with me. And now here I am four years later, still sitting in this storm. Yet at the same time, I have a responsibility to show how I navigate while in the storm. And I'm, I'm tell y'all, I'm uh, listen, listen very, very clearly. Some days are very tough. Some days are not easy. Some days I find myself not wanting to do anything. I want to throw in the towel because there's so much that comes with this, right? But the easiest thing to do is to give up in the middle of the storm, right? Because that's what that's what they did. Uh, we gave up all hope of being saved, verse number 20. God speaks. They have opportunity to live, and then now they're trying to find find their way out of it with the lifeboat. I've been there, y'all. I'm in the middle of this storm, but I've oh, well, I've tried. I've tried to find my lifeboat. Whether it's trying to see what the latest technology is to walk again, or you know, whatever, just something. Just I, I want to get out of this. And it's not happening. It's not happening. So I have a choice, right? I have a choice. And my choice is, do I continue to trust? Or do I lean to my own understanding? And uh, I'm going to tell you what leaning to my own understanding got me, okay? Oh, man, I did not... I did not intend on sharing this much today, but um, it is what it is. Um, so one thing that you deal with 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 paralysis is um, you have to have a, a special cushion, right? Um, because uh, you, lack of sensation, right? You don't know when you're you're sitting on um, your your butt bones too much, right? And and because of the lack of blood flow and all of that, um, you can begin to develop what uh, what's called pressure ulcers. Okay, and these are very deadly. Um, in that they can get infected, um, infection gets in your bloodstream, gets to your heart, and it could kill you, right? Um, open wounds, all that type of stuff. And because your body, um, it, it, the blood flow is not moving as it should, um, you don't heal as quickly either, okay? So when we first, when I first got injured in 2018, within six months, I leaned to my own understanding, okay? So Aaron, how did you do that? Well, 
I went back to work. Six months after a traumatic spinal cord injury, I go back to work because I got to figure out how I'm going to how I'm going to work, how my family's going to eat, how we're going to have the lights on, how we're going to have the, how, all this stuff. All of this is coming upon me. Now, mind you, mind you, this is the Lord allowing this to happen. OK, but I'm taking responsibility for figuring it out. Somebody will catch that tomorrow. <sighs> I'm trying to take responsibility for this. And so I immediately go back to work six months because my short term disability was running out. And I was like, oh, man, where's the money going to come from? Um, man, what, what, what am I going to do? Right. Uh, I got I got to figure it out. Don't, well, the only other thing is not don't ask the Lord for direction on who I need to talk to to get my disability started. No, 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 no. Go figure it out. Go back to work. You can do it. I've, I've not even processed or learned what it's like to be in a wheelchair. All I'm thinking is, well, you just got to sit. So it's no big deal. I didn't take the time, you all, and do the things that were necessary. And now here I am three years later, having had two pressure sores, one healed, and the last one having been infected twice, hospitalized in 2020, right? And now still having to go through different treatments to try to get this thing healed. Why? Because I leaned on my own understanding. I leaned on my own understanding, ladies and gentlemen. Now, God has been gracious. God has been more than enough for me and my family. There's a we never missed a beat. Even when I got I lost the job in 2020. Right. And we've never missed a meal. I've never missed a mortgage payment. I've never missed a light bill. All of these things God has continued to provide. Now, what is incumbent upon me now is now there's a little more weight. Right. There's a little more weight on my shoulders because I got to go to treatments. Right. I got to go get all this other stuff done, but I still have to trust him in the process. When we decide to lean to our own understanding, all we're doing is adding unnecessary weight. I added unnecessary weight to my life because now I've got to manage a sore, right? I've got to make sure I'm doing pressure relief. So I've got to make sure that I've got the supplies that I need to be able to keep it clean so that it's not infected. I got to make sure all these different things. I just added pressure to my life. So we have a decision, ladies and gentlemen. I'm in the storm. I'm in the wheelchair, right? Now, how I navigate in here, I'm trying to find the lifeboats, right? My lifeboat was go back to work. And now look what it cost me. Look what Paul tells them. Paul says, unless these men stay with the ship, you cannot be saved. So if y'all get on that lifeboat, y'all going to die. They got to stay on the ship. The very thing that's about to crash, stay on it. Ah, I got to stay here, ladies and gentlemen, because there's a process. I am proverbially on my way to Rome. Got to stay in it. Whatever your getting to Rome moment looks like, stay where you are. Because. Your life or the lives of others may depend on your ability to sit still. Ooh, I don't. OK, I hear you, Holy Spirit. I hear you. I am a high functioning anxiety person. I'm oh, I'm a high functioning uh, anxious person. And, and for those that know me, just go and drop a heart or drop an amen. Y'all know this about me. And the hardest thing for an anxious person to do is to sit still. See, depressed people, and I'm not making light of it because I've been through depression, but depression, you want to be still, right? You just want to be left alone. You want to not move. But those who are anxious, you're itching, you're always itching to move, to do something. And listen, y'all, this wheelchair, this wheelchair has slowed me down. It has slowed me down physically, but now got to deal with the mind. 
I got you still physically, A-Rod, but now I got to slow you down up here to where you'll focus and trust. Ladies and gentlemen, you make the decision, whether you got in the storm on your own or somebody else's decision, now you have to understand that his word is good. See, because this was pinned before I got in my situation. So my grace is sufficient for you. Guess what? It's a blanket. My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. That's a blanket. Be anxious for nothing, but pray about everything and make your request known to God. Then the peace that surpasses all understanding will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. That's a blanket. So wherever you are, ladies and gentlemen, wherever you are in your storm this morning, understand that there is a word for you and it ain't you finna get out. Oh, no, 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 no. It ain't that is. It's over now. I love the song. I love the song by Kirk Franklin. The storm is over now. But listen, listen, this storm's just beginning. And we may not see daylight for 14 days or 14 years. Do you hear me? But God is still with us as he is with Paul. I can move you. Know, I, I'm sorry. I, I'm going to be out of here in four minutes is my plan. I just wanted to make these last few things known. Check this out. Um, 33 says, just before dawn, Paul urged them all to eat. So 14 days they've not eaten. Uh, for the last 14 days, he said, you have all been in constant suspense and have gone without food. Because you made a decision you should not have made, now you're going hungry because you're trying to figure out how do we stay alive. Ladies and gentlemen, we make a decision that we're not supposed to make. The anxiety kicks in and now you're not eating because you're anxious. You, you can't focus on what you need to focus on because you're anxious. You're trying to figure out how to stay alive. You're trying to figure this thing out. And now you've not even doing the basic things to stay alive. Crazy. So consumed with a storm that they didn't even have to be involved in. That is crazy. But I digress. Uh, and I laugh because I've been there. Um... Now I urge you to take some food. You need it to survive. After he said this, he took some bread and gave thanks to God in front of them all. Why is it important that he did this in front of them? Now, it doesn't say specifically what God, what Paul said to God in giving thanks, but we know that he was expressing gratitude for the moment. Now, what's interesting is that the um, when I was reading... Um, some other translations and then just some um, some history on this, that this was actually a grain ship that they got onto. Yeah. OK. When they when they changed in the first five verses, they got off of one ship and then got on a grain ship. Even before the storm hit, there was already provision. All right. For the need. All right. I'll, I'll leave it alone. Um they were all encouraged and ate some food themselves. Altogether, there were 276 of us on board. When they had eaten as much as they wanted, they lightened the ship by throwing the grain into the sea. All right. When daylight came, they did not recognize the land, but they saw a bay with a sandy beach where they decided to run the ship aground if they could. Cutting loose the anchors, they left them in the sea and at the same time untied the ropes that held the rudders. Then they hoisted the foresail to the wind and made for a beach. But the ship struck a sandbar and ran aground. The bow uh, stuck fast and would not move. And the stern was broken to pieces by the pounding of the surf. The soldiers planned to kill the prisoners to prevent any of them from swimming away and escaping. But the centurion wanted to spare Paul's life and kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and get to land. The rest were to get there on planks or pieces of the ship. In this way, everyone reached land safely. Final thought. 
Final thought. I'm sorry I didn't even put my points up. His way, his results. That That's as simple as I can put a final thought. Um, we see that at the end of this chapter that the men, there was 276 people, right? The men were trying to get in the lifeboat. And uh, the writer Luke reports that all 276 of them, they made it to shore safely. Now, had they put down the lifeboat, they wouldn't have survived. They wouldn't have made it in the storm. So understand, ladies and gentlemen, again, his way is best. Navigate under his direction and you'll get his results. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the clarity. Um, Paul was involved in a situation that he had nothing to do with. Um, but when the opportunity came, he was not silent about who he was and who he served. And so, Father, I pray that if we take nothing else from, from this text, we may not have been the cause of the storm that we're in. Maybe somebody else made a decision, and because they're in uh, close proximity to us, um, we're being affected. See, much like Jonah's decision affected those on the ship with him, those on the ship with Paul affected Paul. Two different decisions led both of these men into their situations. Yet they ended up where they were supposed to go. And God, we know that there really is nothing guaranteed in this life as a disciple, except for suffering and death. You don't promise us big houses. You don't promise us um, worry-free life. You don't promise us um, a bed of roses. No, no. We Two things we are guaranteed, and that is suffering for your name and death. Third is resurrection and eternity with you. And so, God, wherever we have began this walk with you, until we are made perfect, and that is in heaven, help us to know and to trust that everything you've said in your word is good for the middle. Yeah. It's good for the middle. So whether we got into this situation on our own or we made decisions and that placed us here. I mean, other people made decisions that placed us here. Father, may we be the example to those around us. May we be the encouragement to those around us so that when they look at us and they say, why are you not bothered? Why are you not uh, in a panic? Why are you not frantic right now? We can tell them just as Paul did, because the God that I serve, the one that I belong to. He's spoken to me and it's given me peace. And so, Father, may we rely on you and not on our own understanding. Um, it just gets messier when we arrive at our own understanding. And so the anxiety we feel, I'm not, I'm not asking you to take it from us. No. The depression we feel because of decisions, I'm not asking you to take that from us. May you not take it from us, but hold our hand as we work through it. Yeah. Because we need to feel the sting, Father. We do. We do. It's the only way we learn. Um, you touch a hot stove, you touch a stove when it's off, you'll never learn that it can burn you. But now having been burned once or twice you you take precaution in getting near that open flame again and so father ah man feeling the weight of some of this stuff we don't want to feel it uh, we don't even know what feeling it is going to look like in its entirety but i know you too well that when we make decisions father you're not just going to rescue us from it Maybe if it's going to kill us. But for a lot of the things that we've done, Father, nah, it ain't going to kill us. But it sure is going to be a good a good learning lesson. And so, Father, I, 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 just, 
I am in awe at the text today. Um, and so I pray for my brothers and sisters, wherever they are, Father, help them to navigate under your direction. Yeah, it's going to be a little heavier, but um, you're, you're, you're our spotter, proverbially, right? You're not going to let the weight crush. Give us assistance as needed, but we still have still got more reps in this gym of discipleship. So, Father, I pray for my brothers, Marcus and Brenton, whatever the week looks like, whatever it's going to look like, um, God, whatever the things that they may face or be challenged with uh, this week, tested with and or tempted with. Father, I pray that you would help them to make the right decisions. And even if they make the, the, the wrong decision, um, Father, we know that your grace is sufficient. And so I pray that you would give them the grace and the strength to work through those decisions. Um, and Father, I pray for everyone who's going to hear this video, see this video, God, that it would speak to their hearts and it would push them in a direction, God, to make a decision to trust you. We love you. We thank you in the matchless, the mighty, the name above all names, Jesus, the Christ, son of the living God. We thank you. Amen. All right, guys, I appreciate y'all for for being on um, this morning. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I am hopeful that we are going to be consistent, um, that I'm going to be consistent being able to get uh, back here um, for sure by eight shooting for 730 um, as that allows some some flexibility between what I got to do next after half. Um, you guys have a great Tuesday. Marcus will close us out tomorrow in Acts chapter 28. We'll hear from B as we open up um, the, the book of Romans. And listen, if you want to have your theology rocked, um, tune in to us, tune in to us for, uh, for this walk through Romans. All right. So you guys have a great day. Remember if it sounds like scripture, it must be found in scripture in the context of the passage, the context of the book, and in the context of the overall canon of the Bible. All right. Peace out.